I'm Donna Lashander Hockfog, and I'm here at the Warehouse Theater in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to read a story by David Sedaris called You Can't Kill the Rooster. And if you have children within earshot or adults who don't like strong language, it's probably not for you. You Can't Kill the Rooster. When I was young, my father was transferred, and our family moved from western New York State to Raleigh, North Carolina. IBM had relocated a great many northerners, and together we made relentless fun of our new neighbors and their pokey, backward way of life. Rumors circulated that locals ran stills out of their tool sheds and referred to their house cats as good eaten. Our parents coached us never to use the titles ma'am or sir when speaking to a teacher or shopkeeper. Tobacco was acceptable in the form of a cigarette, but should any of us experiment with plug or snuff, we would be automatically disinherited. Mountain Dew was forbidden, and our speech was monitored for the slightest hint of a Raleigh accent. Use the word y'all. And before you knew it, you'd find yourself in a haystack, French kissing an underage goat. Along with grits and hush puppies, the abbreviated form of you all was a dangerous step on an insidious path leading straight to the doors of the Baptist church. We might not have been the wealthiest people in town, but at least we weren't one of them. Our family remained free from outside influence until 1968, when my mother gave birth to my brother, Paul, a North Carolina native, who has since grown to become both my father's best ally and worst nightmare. Here was a child who, by the time he had reached second grade, spoke much like the toothless fishermen casting their nets into Abermel Sound. This is the 30-year-old son who now phones his father to say, Motherfucker! I ain't seen pussy in so long, I throw stones at it. My brother's voice, like my own, is high-pitched and girlish. Telephone solicitors frequently ask to speak to our husbands, and room service operators appease us by saying, That shouldn't take more than 15 minutes, Mrs. Sedaris. The Raleigh accent is soft and beautifully cadenced. But my brother's is a more complex hybrid, informed by his professional relationships with marble-mouthed, deep country laborers and his abiding love of hardcore rap music. He talks so fast you find yourself concentrating on the gist of his message, rather than trying to decipher the actual words. It's like speaking to a foreigner and understanding only the terms, motherfucker, bitch, and hass, and the phrase, you can't kill the rooster. The rooster is what Paul calls himself when he's feeling threatened. Asked how he came up with that name, he says only, Certain motherfuckers think they can fuck with my shit, but you can't kill the rooster. You might fuck him up sometimes, but bitch, nobody kills the motherfucking rooster. You know what I'm saying? It often seems that my brother and I were raised in two completely different households. He's 11 years younger than I am, and by the time he reached high school, the rest of us had all left home. When I was young, we weren't allowed to say, shut up. But by the time Paul reached his teens, it had become acceptable, acceptable to shout, shut your motherfucking mouth. The drug laws had changed as well. No smoking pot became no smoking pot in the house before it finally, pe finally petered out to, please don't smoke any pot in the living room. My mother was, for the most part, delighted with my brother and regarded him with the bemused curiosity of a brood hen, discovering she has hatched a completely different species. I think it was very nice of Paul to give me this face, she once said, arranging a bouquet of wildflowers into the skull-shaped bong my brother had left on the dining room table. It's non-traditional, but that's the rooster's way. He's a free spirit and we're lucky to have him. Like most everyone else in our suburban neighborhood, we were raised to meet a certain standard. My father had dreams of me becoming a great athlete and attending an Ivy League school. While I was happy to bottle and diaper my first football, I had no interest in actually throwing the thing. My grades were average at best, and eventually, 
I learned to live with my father's disappointment. Fortunately, there were six of us children, and it was easy to get lost in the crowd. My sisters and I managed to sneak beneath the wire of his expectations, but I worried about my brother, who was seen as the family's last hope. From the age of 10, Paul was dressed in Brooks Brothers suits and tiny red clip-on ties. He endured soccer camps, church-sponsored basketball tournaments, and after-school sessions with well-meaning tutors who would politely change the subject when asked about the rooster's chances of getting into Yale or Princeton. Fast and well-coordinated, Paul never minded sports, just so long as he was either stoned or winning. School failed to interest him on any level, and he considered it an accomplishment to receive an occasional D-. His response to my father's impossible and endless demands has, over time, become something of a mantra. Short and sweet, repeated at a fever pitch, it goes simply, fuck it! Or on one of his more articulate days, fuck it, motherfucker! That shit don't mean fuck to me! My brother politely ma'ams and serves all strangers, but refers to friends and family, his father included, as either bitch or motherfucker! Friends are appalled at the way he speaks to his only remaining parent. The two of them recently visited my sister Amy and me in New York City, and we celebrated with a dinner party. When my father complained about his aching feet, the rooster set down his two-liter Mountain Dew and removed a fistful of prime rib from his mouth, saying, Bitch, you need to have an ugly-ass bunion shaved down is what you need to do, but you can't do shit about it tonight, so lighten up, motherfucker. All eyes went to my father, who chuckled, saying only, I guess you have a point. A stranger might reasonably interpret my brother's language as a lack of respect and view my father's response as a kind of shameful surrender. This, though, would be missing the subtle beauty of their relationship. My father is the type who will recite a body limerick by saying, A woman I know who's quite blunt had a bear trap installed in her. Oh, you know, it's a base vernacular term for the female gentalia. He can absolutely kill a joke. When pushed to his limit, this is a man who shouts, Fudge! And sometimes follows it with a shake of his fist and a hearty, G-D-U! I've never heard him curse. Yet he and my brother see, seem to have found a common language that eludes the rest of us. My father likes to talk about money. Spending doesn't interest him, especially when it comes to tipping. He prefers money as a concept, something that, if invested with care, will mature at a 6.5% inoculated rate of fiduciary-based annuity. Something like that. I can drink 18 cups of coffee and still collapse into sleep at first mention of the word dividend. Still, though, I make an effort to listen to him, if only because it seems like the polite thing to do. When my father talks finance to my brother, Paul says, Fuck the Santa Claus, you're wearing me out. This rarely ends the scheduled lecture, but my brother wins bonus points for boldly voicing his disinterest, just as my father would do were someone to corner him to talk about Buddhism or the return of the clog. The two of them are unapologetically blunt. It's a quality my father admires so much he's able to ignore the foul language completely. That Paul, he says, now there's a guy who knows how to get his point across. When words fail him, the rooster has been known to communicate with his fists, which, though quick and solid, are no larger than a couple of tangerines. At five foot four, he's shorter than I am, stocky, but not exactly intimidating. I last saw my brother at Christmas when he arrived at my older sister's house with a black eye. There had been some encounter at a bar, but the details were sketchy. Some motherfucker told me to get the fuck out of his motherfucking face, so I said, chill, motherfucker. Then what? Then he turned away, and I reached up and punched him in the back of his motherfucking neck. What happened next? What the fuck you think happened, bitch? I ran like hell, and the motherfucker caught up with me in the parking lot. He was all beefy and shit. The motherfucker had a taste for blood, and he just pulled my ass. When did he stop? My brother drummed his fingers on the tabletop for a few moments before saying, I'm guessing he stopped when he was fucking finished. 
The physical pain had passed, but it bothered Paul that his face was all lopsided and shit for the fucking holidays. That said, he retreated to the bathroom with my sister Amy's makeup kit and returned to the table with two black eyes, the second drawn on with mascara. This seemed to please him, and he wore his matching bruises for the rest of the evening. Did you get a load of that fake black eye? My father asked, struggling for a positive spin. That guy ought to do makeup for the movies. I'm telling you, the kid's a real artist. Unlike the rest of us, the rooster has always enjoyed my father's support and encouragement. With the dreams of Princeton officially dead and buried, he sent my brother to technical school, hoping he might express an interest in computers. Three weeks into the semester, Paul dropped out, and my father, convinced that his lawn mowing skills bordered on genius, set him up in the landscaping business. I've seen him in action, and what he does is establish a pattern and really tackle it. When the landscaping business failed, my father suggested careers in television repair, stand-up comedy, and eventually professional tennis. I taped that Wimbledon match, and I think that once you put a racket in that kid's hands, the guy will go absolutely bananas. He's got the temperament for it. Now all he needs is a couple of lessons. Eventually, my brother fell into the sand, the floor sanding business. It's hard work, but he enjoys the gratification that comes with a well-finished rec room. He thoughtfully named his company Silly Peas Hardwood Floors. When my father suggested that the word silly might frighten away the upper tier customers, Paul thought of changing the name to Silly Fucking Peas Hardwood Floors. The work puts him in contact with plumbers and drywallers from such towns as Bunn and Clayton, men who offer dating advice such as, if she's old enough to bleed, she's old enough to breed, and if there's grass on the field, I say it's time to play ball. Oh, Paul, my father says, those aren't the sort of people you need to be associating with. If you want to better yourself, you need to spend more time with someone who can read or at least get through a single sentence without spitting. After all these years, our father has never understood that we, his children, tend to gravitate towards the very people he spent his life warning us about. Most of us have left town, but my brother remains in Raleigh. He was there when my mother died, and six years later continues to help my father grieve. The past is gone, Hoss. What you need now is some motherfucking pussy. While my sisters and I offer our sympathy long distance, Paul is the one who arrives at our father's home on Thanksgiving Day, offering to prepare traditional Greek dishes to the best of his ability. It is a fact that he once made a tray of Spanakopita using Pam rather than melted butter. Still, though, at least he tries. When a recent hurricane damaged my father's house, my brother rushed over with a gas grill, three coolers full of beer, and a traditional fuck it bucket, a plastic pail filled with jawbreakers and bite-sized candy bars. When shit brings you down, just say fuck it and eat yourself some motherfucking candy. There was no electricity for close to a week. The yard was practically cleared of trees, and rain fell through the dozens of holes torn into the roof. Shitting in the woods gets old pretty fucking fast, Paul said. We're living like pioneers, all crusty and shit. It was a difficult time, but the two of them stuck it out, my brother placing his small, scarred hand on my father's shoulder to say, Bitch, I'm here to tell you it's gonna be all right. We'll get through this shit, motherfucker.